First, let's look at some of the interpretive issues associated with reading the major sources for reconstructing a life of Christ, namely the four canonical Gospels. The Gospels can be read with profit in two different ways, both legitimate. One way is to read the Gospels horizontally, that is, to read the four Gospels as one consistent story of the life of Christ. This is sometimes referred to as harmonizing the Gospels, blending the four distinct Gospel voices, if you will, into one consistent harmony, treating them as if they are a quartet. The other way is to read the Gospels vertically, that is, allowing each Gospel voice to sing a solo to keep the metaphor going, listening to and paying attention to the particular vocalizations, idiosyncrasies, and peculiar emphases of each gospel. In this week's le lecture, we explore the first method of reading the gospels, reading them horizontally, blending the four gospels into a quartet of harmonized voices so that they tell a single story of the life of Christ. Then in modules three and four, we explore the second way of reading the gospels, dipping into each one vertically and allowing each one to sing with its own solo voice, its individual ballad of the life of Christ without running the other gospels' voices into the mix. As you will see, there is something to be learned from both approaches. We can treat the gospels as a quartet because the framework of the story is essentially the same in all four, namely geographical. The story begins with Jesus' birth and preparation for ministry in Judea, then moves to Jesus' early ministry up in the north around the lake known as the Sea of Galilee, followed by a journey southward back to Judea, where there is a brief conflicted ministry in Jerusalem, which leads to his arrest, trial, crucifixion, and resurrection. Only Matthew and Luke among the Gospels give us information about Jesus' birth and childhood, and that information is highly selected. There are so many questions we would like to ask about Jesus' youth. Did he have close friends? What was his relationship with his mother and Joseph? Were they close? Did he get along with his siblings? But Matthew and Luke seem not to be interested in answering our questions. They focus instead on Jesus' miraculous birth, the threat his existence apparently created for the power structures, and in Luke's case, the fact that Jesus was born into a pious Jewish family who faithfully observed the heritage and cultural obligations of their religion and race. Luke alone among the Gospels presents information about Jesus' childhood, a story that occurs during a parental pilgrimage to Jerusalem around the age of 12 or 13, possibly related to Jesus' bar mitzvah. The story hints that Jesus already demonstrates a developing messianic awareness. All four Gospels indicate that John the Baptist had a pivotal role in Jesus' early ministry. Jesus was baptized by John, associating himself with John's ministry of repentance and preparation in advance of the day of the Lord and the advent of the Messianic age. Indeed, it seems that the arrest of John was the catalyst that caused Jesus to leave the security of his home in Nazareth and go to the Sea of Galilee to begin his own preaching ministry. Moreover, Jesus' message was the very same message as John's. The time has come. The kingdom of God has arrived. Repent and believe the good news. Following his baptism by John, Jesus went into the desert to engage Satan on his home turf in what is called the temptations of Jesus. But the better translation of the Greek word, pigrasmos, is trial or test. Jesus is tested in the wilderness where he confronts and defeats Satan who has set up his own illegitimate kingdom in opposition to God's. And Jesus emerges from that triumph to announce that the kingdom of God has arrived. The 
The first half of Jesus' ministry took place in the north around the Sea of Galilee. Jesus made Capernaum a fishing village on the north end of the lake, the center of his ministry. Capernaum was strategically located on the border between the territory of Antipater and Philip. Antipater, who arrested and later executed John the Baptist, saw Jesus also as a threat because Jesus, like John, preached the coming of the kingdom of God. And so Capernaum offered a measure of protection for Jesus. If things got too hot in Capernaum, Jesus could walk only about a mile east and be in the territory of Philip where Antipater could not touch him. Jesus' early ministry, which included both preaching about the arrival of the kingdom of God and performing miracles as signs the kingdom had come, was at first welcomed by the masses. Though opposition to Jesus emerged early on among the religious leaders who saw his immense popularity among the masses as a threat to their credibility and control. Key teachings related to the kingdom of God included both the Sermon on the Mount and a number of parables or stories that surprised and jolted the hearers into new ways of thinking and looking at things. But when Jesus started to suggest that a cross awaited both him and his followers, the crowds quickly evaporated. The Synoptic Gospels agree that Peter's confession of Jesus as Messiah at Caesarea Philippi was a turning point in Jesus' early ministry, where he, as it were, went public with the fact that he would not be the expected military Messiah the people wanted, but rather the suffering servant Messiah of the Isianic prophecies. Following that dramatic confession and confrontation, Jesus increasingly turned his attention away from the crowds to his disciples, whom he instructed regarding the character and cost of the kingdom. Luke describes Jesus' journey from Galilee in the north to Jerusalem in the south where Jesus would finally face the cross. In a long, highly readable travel narrative, running from Luke 9.51 to 1927, Luke describes Jesus' journey to Jerusalem for the inevitable showdown with the religious leaders. This long section includes some of Jesus' most well-known teachings and parables, including the parables of the Good Samaritan and the Prodigal Son. It ends with Jesus arriving in Jerusalem as a messianic king with great popular acclaim in what has been called the triumphal entry, cleansing the temple, actually cursing it for failing to live up to its purpose, and then retreating to the Mount of Olives where he weeps over the city. Jesus next engages in a bit of shuttle confrontation in which he moves from Bethany on the other side of the Mount of Olives back and forth across the Kidron Valley to Jerusalem and the temple where he teaches daily and confronts the religious establishment for their foibles and failures. Quickly, the religious leaders realize that Jesus must be eliminated if they are to retain their place and power, and so they plot to do him in. A series of traps are laid for Jesus in which he is presented with no-win scenarios, such as, should a Jew pay taxes to Caesar? <laughs> no matter how he answers, he either alienates his base or he commits treason against the Roman occupation. Though Jesus deftly avoids the trap, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. The religious leaders are successful in getting Jesus arrested for blasphemy, the Jewish charge, and sedition, the Roman charge. Jesus' trial had two phases because there were two charges, a Jewish trial before the Sanhedrin on the charge of blasphemy, and a Roman trial before the military governor or prefect, Pontius Pilate, on the charge of sedition. When Jesus appeared before Caiaphas, the high priest who presided over the Sanhedrin, 
Caiaphas attempted to get Jesus to incriminate himself by asking him directly, are you the Messiah? When Jesus suggested that he was, Caiaphas tore his clothes as a sign of blasphemy and remanded Jesus to the custody of Pilate, who alone could order the death penalty. Pilate, who cared nothing about Jewish sensitivities regarding blasphemy, was nonetheless required to investigate another more serious charge, at least from the Roman point of view, against Jesus, namely sedition or plotting the overthrow of the Roman government. Pilate tried to avoid responsibility by sending Jesus to Herod Antipater, but when Antipater would have none of it, Pilate again found himself in the crucible of judgment. Hoping for one last chance to avoid the whole affair, Pilate decides as a gesture of goodwill to release a condemned criminal in honor of the Jewish Thanksgiving festival, Passover. But when the crowds demanded Bar Barabbas instead of Jesus, Jesus is ordered crucified. Crucifixion was an excruciatingly painful way to die. Most victim, victims died of dehydration and shock rather than the wounds themselves. It was intended to send a message to any would-be criminals who dared defy Rome. Jesus was crucified between two criminals just outside the city walls at a place called Golgotha, or skull in Hebrew. Jesus was crucified on a Friday morning and was dead before sundown that same night. Laid to rest in the tomb of the Sanhedrin member Joseph of Arimathea, some women followers came early on the following Sunday morning to complete the burial preparations interrupted by the start of the Sabbath. But when they arrived, the tomb was empty. The risen Jesus then appeared to several of his followers, including Mary Magdalene, Simon Peter, and John, son of Zebedee, as well as to many, many others over the 40 days or so that he remained prior to his ascension. Before departing, the risen Jesus instructed the disciples to remain in Jerusalem until empowered by the Holy Spirit to continue his ministry of announcing the arrival of the kingdom of God. A final note on the resurrection. The four Gospels all differ in the details of their individual accounts of the resurrection of Jesus, but on one thing they all agree, that Jesus first appeared to women. What makes this striking and noteworthy is the fact that in first century Judaism, the testimony of women was not considered credible. Both Josephus, a first century Jewish historian, and the Talmud, a collection of Jewish writings, which though composed in the fifth century, nonetheless reflect earlier Jewish practice, agree that any evidence which a woman gives is not valid. A quotation from Rosh Hashanah in the Talmud. Consequently, if you were going to make up a story about Jesus' resurrection, the last thing you would do is to include in the story that women witnessed the event. The gospel writers agree, even though as Jews, they knew it would cast doubt on the credibility of their stories, that women were the first to see the risen Jesus, because that is exactly what happened. The gospel writers include that detail because it was true and could not be denied or avoided. Powerful evidence of the historicity of the resurrection established on critical ground.